um, feel free to submit questions in the chat and we will help address those. Um, you can also submit questions for the presenters in the Q&A box. And just so everyone knows, this presentation is being recorded. With that, I'm going to hand things over to David Feldman of NREL. David? Thanks so much, Jackie. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, we are here today to review the findings of the Q1 2020 U.S. Solar Photovoltaic System and Energy Storage Cost Benchmark, a technical report released last month detailing the costs of PV standalone storage, uh, uh, PV standalone systems, storage systems connected to the grid, and PV paired with storage. I'm joined with me today by some of my co-authors, Agnesh Ramasamy and Robert Margolis. We plan on summarizing the findings for about 40 minutes and then taking any questions. Uh, like Jackie said, please feel free to write any questions you have throughout the presentation in the Q&A box. We will get to them. We will begin our talk with an introduction to the work and some key definitions for the technologies and framework which we will be discussing. We'll then provide a brief overview of the PV model outputs, the changes we made to the residential PV soft cost modeling, and our work benchmarking O and M and LCOE. Uh, then we'll show. Uh, I'm sorry. O and M. Then we'll show how our benchmarks translate into lifetime costs on a dollar per kilowatt hour basis for various resource classes, in terms of LCOE. We'll then switch gears to briefly reviewing our storage and PV plus storage models and discuss how we've designed a way to present our PV plus storage benchmarks in terms of a lifetime cost basis as well. If you'd like to review the report in detail, see summary slides, or download the data yourself, please feel, find the links here or on NREL's library, or just feel free to Google. Uh, it, will, it will pop up. So a little background. NREL has been modeling US PV system costs since 2009. Each year, we try to make adjustments to do a better job of characterizing the industry as a whole. This year, we benchmark PV standalone systems, storage standalone systems, and PV plus storage systems in the residential, commercial, and utility scale space. Our bottom-up methodology attempts to account for all typical system and project development costs borne by an installer and or developer, as well as the profits they receive for selling the system. Our current work builds on several key publications, including the Tracking the Sun and Utility Scale Solar Series from the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, or LBNL, as well as the storage and PV system cost benchmarks published from NREL previously. I'm going to hand it over to Vignesh to provide a background on the structure of the models, key cost components and definitions, and important model outputs we made this year. Hey, uh, thanks, David, uh, for the introduction. And uh, thanks to everyone on the call uh, for joining us today. So uh, in this initial segment of the uh, presentation, uh, on a very high level, I'll be talking about NREL's bottom-up cost model uh, you know, that helped us to estimate uh, PV and storage cost numbers um, that you all would have seen in our uh, Q1 2020 benchmark report. Um, so um, I'll start with the key cost categories uh, included in our total system cost estimates. Uh, we have um, commoditized items um, like module, inverter and batteries like you see in the first two rows of this table and you know and the total cost of these components are you know estimated simply by uh, multiplying the system capacity and the publicly available dollar per watt cost um, so uh, and the highlighted cost categories uh, in this table are where you know we have done a detailed cost modeling by analyzing all different sub components and activities you know, an associated labor effort uh, required on both the DC and AC site, uh, which are common in a typical solar or storage project installation uh, in a given benchmark here. Uh, and the last part of the table, you know, shows a soft cost, um, you know, things like sales tax, overhead and uh, profit margin, uh, and they are estimated as a percentage of uh, total material cost or, you know, total developer cost, uh, depending on which category it is. And um, also we take into account how the cost and quantity of some of these components change, you know, as we have economies of scale and how the cost could also change for a, a specific system design. And this is all detailed uh, in the report. Uh, could you go to the next slide, please, David? 
So um, this slide shows our uh, high level framework for system cost modeling. Uh, in order to calculate all the key balance of system cost categories, uh, we list out all the major or um, key steps involved in a PV or storage installation project. Uh, for instance, we have uh, listed few different activities for structural balance of system uh, in the table at the bottom of the slide, as you can see. And also we figure out uh, different inputs, you know, by location, by uh, time, and then by system capacity, and then set up the cost calculation accordingly. Uh, for example, um, you know, in, in order to estimate the cost of a ground mount PV system, some of the major items we would like to figure out are uh, things like, you know, how many number of modules and inverters are required and how much space is available for installation and uh, how much material we would need for racking structure and uh, things like wiring and uh, also how much labor it would take for different construction and electrical activities uh, with that you know also we gather location based uh, in like wind speed and average amount of snow uh, that is accumulated you know in a certain location to determine number of uh, vertical columns or posts uh, and the spacing between them required uh, in order to support the horizontal tubing structure. And uh, this is the kind of analysis, you know, that is repeated for uh, different cost categories and the sub um, uh, within our cost model. So uh, in our cost modeling, um, uh, we have used RS means construction cost data, you know, which gives us a fair estimate of uh, material and labor requirement for uh, different construction and electrical activities. Uh, likewise, you know, we have used labor uh, wage data uh, by state uh, from, you know, which is sourced from Bureau of Labor Statistics um, to estimate the total labor cost. Uh, and some of the cost components, like I said before, you know, the overhead and profit markup percentage are based on uh, the uh, interview that we do with uh, industry experts and you know um, and things like commodity price for module and inverters are extracted from uh, third party r and d reports uh, you know from companies like woodmac uh, or bnef uh, for all the cost model we have built you know is capable of estimating cost based on a, a specific state within the united state uh, however, the cost numbers we have uh, reported this year is based on US average value, and David will cover the reason behind it in the uh, later part of this presentation. Uh, next slide, please, David. Um, okay, uh, this slide, you know, uh, provides a brief overview of, you know, which cost drivers affect certain cost categories and the uh, inputs we use, and then the corresponding outputs they generate. Uh, for a utility scale PV system. And we have this model structure, you know, uh, defined for residential and commercial uh, scale systems as well. So um, we model the commercial, residential, and utility scale markets a little differently to account for the differences in uh, markets and cost drivers. So uh, while there are some commonalities, there are also some key differences between these uh, model structures. Uh, for example, uh, in the residential models, the soft costs uh, like overhead and development costs are modeled in detail uh, through a line item approach and we have a separate you know uh, model for the, for the soft cost itself uh, while uh, in the commercial and utility scale models you know we just use a, a percentage or a markup value uh, in order to calculate those values um, next slide please david so um, in our report uh, we have summarized all of the input values and cost categories that we have used in our models uh, in an effort to provide as much transparency as we can to what our numbers mean and how they were derived. Uh, just for this presentation's sake, I'm not going to get into details, but you know, I can call out a few important assumptions and its source. Uh, one of the main sources uh, for our input and inputs and assumptions, uh, as David mentioned before, comes from uh, LBNL's Tracking the Sun uh, report. Uh, for instance, the assumptions like uh, DCAC ratio, uh, the inverter market share, and then the uh, market share between small installers versus large integrators, uh, all comes from the LBNL's report. Uh, 
and uh, uh, things like you know the module and inverted commodity prices are from uh, market insight report uh, released by Woodmac every quarter. So like this, you know, we have um, detailed all the sources uh, for the different cost components in the model. And, you know, um, uh, as you can see in this slide, so I'll move on to the next slide, David. Okay, so, um, a, you know, a note on some of the key terms used in this slide. So uh, all values that you see in this presentation and in the report are quoted in 2019 USD, you know, unless otherwise noted. Uh, the PV systems are quoted in DC and uh, the storage, uh, you know, is either quoted in total dollar cost or, you know, in dollar per uh, kilowatt hours or dollar per megawatt hours. So um, also we model the rooftop residential systems uh, between four to seven kilowatts, uh, you know, since the time we started benchmarking and the commercial systems uh, that we have benchmarked, uh, you know, are in the range of, you know, a system size between 100 kilowatts and two megawatts. And uh, this year, also, I wanted to point out that we have expanded from uh, just modeling the commercial rooftop systems to also modeling uh, commercial ground mount systems uh, to account for their growing market share. Um, and uh, we also model the utility scale PV systems, you know, um, in the size ranging between five megawatts and 100 megawatts uh, using either a fixed tilt or one axis tracker type systems. So uh, with that, I will let David Feldman to uh, talk in detail about uh, NREL's Q1 2020 uh, PV and storage cost numbers uh, in detail. Oh, thanks Ignesh. Uh, well, just before I do that, I was just gonna briefly go over some some uh, some key changes from the previous report um, so um, um, uh, first uh, firstly uh, um, the, as, as Ignace mentioned uh, there's some uh, new system benchmarks included uh, which include commercial grandma systems uh, and commercial PV plus storage systems which general hadn't hasn't previously um, um, Benchmark before. Uh, we also include the levelized cost of solar plus storage, which we hadn't published before. Um, we we're also in this report using monocrystalline PV modules, um, where previous historical benchmarks had used multi crystalline. Uh, and this switches reflects the overall trend occurring in the US market. Um, as, as also Big Nash mentioned, um, uh, for our residential benchmark analysis, we are, we've expanded our modeling. Uh, of customer acquisition, engineering, permitting, interconnection, uh, 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 and uh, uh, permitting <laughs> and overhead. Uh, in addition to providing finer cost granularity, uh, we include additional costs borne by many U.S. installers that were not captured in previous editions. Therefore, our benchmark soft costs in this report are higher than those in previous reports. Uh, for our previous editions of this report, we uh, also assumed the land acquisition cost of approximately three cents a lot. But based off of uh, uh, LBNL report, uh, stated that most utility scale PV projects do not own the land on which PV systems are placed. We have reclassified land costs from an upfront capital expenditure to uh, operating expenditure. It's a land acquisition lease payment uh, for, for both years 2019 and 2020. Uh, additionally, uh, the current version of our cost models make a few significant changes, as I mentioned, uh, as compared to our previously, most previous uh, recent published benchmark, which was our Q1 2018 report. So to better distinguish the historical cost trends over time for the uh, from the changes to our cost models, we also calculate our Q1 2019 and Q1 2020 PV benchmarks using the Q1 2018 versions of the residential, commercial, and utility scale PV modules to, to better differentiate that. We have a whole appendix uh, in the report that sort of goes uh, line by line explaining sort of the difference between the models. So uh, we're now going to review the model outputs for this year and compare them to previous year's benchmark. Um, so this, this figure provides a summary of our PV cost benchmarks over time. As you can see from 2010 to 2020, there was a 64%, 69%, and 82% reduction in the residential commercial rooftop and utility scale PV system cost benchmarks, respectively. 
A significant portion of that reduction can be attributed to reductions in hardware costs, with module prices dropping 85% over that period. However, virtually all cost categories fell over that decade. As noted previously, uh, because of the changes in modeling this year, we include black bars in the figure, which add up to the difference in cost between our current model uh, and previous model cost outputs. Zooming in on the analysis we perform for this report, uh, we modeled Q1 2020 PV system costs to be $2.71 a watt for a 7 kilowatt residential PV system, $1.72 a watt for a 200 kilowatt commercial rooftop PV system, and $1.01 a watt for a 100 megawatt utility scale PV system with one axis tracking. Between 2019 and 2020, cost reductions were achieved through improvements in module efficiency and decreases in BOS hardware costs. Uh, these were counterbalanced by increases in labor wages, cost of steel, and the cost of modules and certain inverters uh, going up in price. So in addition to our natural benchmarks, um, we model PV systems dependent on installer type for residential systems, which is uh, the top left, inverter type for rooftop systems, size for commercial and utility scale PV systems, and mounting type for utility scale PV systems. Uh, this is the first year we have modeled a commercial ground mount PV system, uh, and uh, owing to the increased adoption of the 2017 and 2020 NEC in many states, uh, we also include uh, different inverter types for commercial rooftop systems. Uh, while there are trade-offs to many of these configurations, in general, we find economies of scale driven by hardware, labor, and related markups. We also see trade-offs between cost and performance uh, or functionality when comparing inverter types or mounting structures. We also switched this here from providing cost details for specific locations in lieu of performing uh, sensitivity analysis with cost categories that vary by location and hardware specification, uh, and then having uh, national averages for our, our benchmark. We believe that we were not capturing certain location-specific cost categories previously, such as variations in permitting procedure, overhead and profit, and therefore we're presenting a false level of precision. So the sensitivity analysis we performed in the Q1 2020 report, we found that costs varied the greatest for rooftop systems based on inverter type by equipment and material location factors for ground mounting systems. This next section will cover the changes made to our residential PV soft cost model and modeling. It represents the largest change in cost between our models and our new uh, our, between our old models and our new models. We did not redo our modeling design for all residential PV soft costs. Installation labor, sales tax, supply chain, and profit are consistent with previous models, though with potentially different inputs. We focused our changes on costs associated with engineering, customer acquisition, permitting and inspection, and overhead. These cost categories include a wide array of activities and expenses, many of which are not applicable in every installation and many of which uh, occur for sales which do not eventually close. We attempted to incorporate the wide range of cost procedures by weighting costs by their national average use and close rate. For example, some of the costs are associated with referral fees as a percentage of their use in the marketplace, and some costs are associated with online bidding platforms. Um, similarly, for permitting and interconnection, some costs are associated with online permit applications, while others are associated with employees driving multiple times to a permitting office. While we based our numbers on national averages, we also built two separate models, one for small installers and another for national integrators to account for the different business models used to sell and install residential PV in the U.S. Our soft cost numbers are fairly similar to those reported by national integrators, though we tend to report lower costs associated with the installation process. This may be due to differences in accounting practices and the forward-looking nature of our modeling. There are also slight differences in prices and price between our small installer and national integrator model. With the national integrators leveraging their size and buying power to have lower installation costs, but higher costs associated with customer acquisition. For comparative purposes, uh, we also built a new construction business structure using the expanded modeling in the Q1 2020 version of the residential PV model for customer acquisition, engineering, uh, PII, and overhead. The new construction case assumes residential PV systems are part of 
standard feature of a new production home, which is akin to the legislation passed in California mandating such a practice. Some developers in other states also offer production homes and new developments, residential PV systems as the default feature. As indicated above, new builds are 65 cents a lot less expensive than retrofits. This is due to substantially lower customer acquisition and PII costs, as well as reduced cost costs through efficiencies in labor and structural BOS. Some authorities or building, buildings require additional hardware, installation labor, and roofing costs, which are not included in our standard model. Uh, this year, we also estimated these additional costs, uh, which on average contribute approximately 26 cents a watt to the 70 kilowatt residential PV system uh, and might be, uh, you know, help contribute to the uh, differences between our, our uh, benchmark numbers and some nationally reported averages you might see uh, available uh, in, in other reports. So we've also had a separate modeling effort, which has uh, developed a model to calculate the costs associated with PV system O&M. A total of 133 measures in the cost model are sorted into nine O&M cost categories. The 2019 and 2020 values in the report are higher than those from previous NREL benchmark reports because we uh, also include costs not previously calculated. These include five additional line measures, land lease, property taxes, insurance, asset management, and security, and are added based on feedback collected by uh, LBNL from U.S. solar industry professionals. We input our national average benchmark costs, including CapEx and, um, and O&M, uh, into NREL system advisor model for three resource areas and calculate a range of LCOE. Over the past 10 years, we found that LCOE was reduced 73% for residential systems, reaching 11 to 15 cents per kilowatt hour without subsidies, and 7 to 9 cents per kilowatt hour with a 30% ITC. 77% for commercial rooftop systems, reaching 8 to 10 cents per kilowatt hour without subsidies, and 5 to 7 cents per kilowatt hour with a 30% ITC, and 82% for one axis utility scale PV systems, reaching 4 to 5 cents per kilowatt hour without subsidies, and 2.5 to 3.5 cents with the 30% ITC. Uh, so the reduction in total cost, uh, capital costs, along with improvements in operation, system design, and technology have resulted in significant reductions in the cost of electricity. U.S. residential and commercial PV systems are 93 and 97% uh, towards achieving the Department of Energy uh, 2020 electricity price target, uh, uh, 2020 price targets. And the utility scale PV systems uh, targets actually achieved their, their 2020 uh, DOE targets three years early. We're now going to switch gears and discuss our solar plus storage modeling efforts. Uh, we model storage only system costs for residential, commercial, and utility scale sectors with varying amounts of storage. Systems with longer duration storage cost more in about in absolute terms, but are cheaper in kilowatt hours of storage as batteries become cheaper with greater size and non-battery costs are spread over more hours of storage. Combining models, we estimate PV plus storage costs. In the residential model, we show a less and more resilient storage configuration. And for commercial and utility scale systems, we estimate DC configured and AC configured systems, as well as battery and PV systems in different sites. Based on our residential model, adding batteries to a PV system can more than double the cost depending on one's need for resiliency. For our commercial and utility scale systems, we see minor variations in price between DC and AC coupled systems and modest cost benefits of co-locating PV and storage facilities. Comparing our current benchmark in work to previous modeling efforts, we found a 9% and 8% reduction in utility scale PV plus storage benchmarks between 2018 and 2020 for DC coupled and AC coupled systems respectively. Approximately 28% to 30% of the total cost reduction can be attributed to lithium ion battery and bidirectional inverter cost reductions. Although there are some configuration differences between AC and DC coupled systems, for example, 
uh, inverter, structural BOS, and electrical BOS, the total cost difference between them is uh, we found to be only um, about 1%. The last time we benchmarked uh, residential PV plus storage was in 2016. Comparing our current numbers to those, we found that there were 11% and 25% reductions in residential PV plus storage um, benchmarks between 2016 and 2020 for AC coupled, less resilient and more resilient cases respectively. Most of these reductions can be attributed to reductions in the cost of PV modules and AC coupled batteries. The cost reductions occurred despite the rated capacity of the 22 module system increasing from 5.6 kilowatts to some kilowatt, kilowatts between 2016 and 2020. And despite the fact that uh, the PV system is larger, um, the total cost actually still went down. So this year we also took a step forward in trying to convert our upfront PV plus storage costs into lifetime energy costs, similar to LCOE. The main differences between the LCUSS and LCOE formulas are the inclusion of round trip energy losses associated to and from the battery, the battery, the follow on investment of battery replacements, percent of generation fed into the battery, and the annual electricity purchased from the grid, if any. Uh, for our modeling purposes, we didn't include any because uh, we assumed um, currently. Uh, Participants would try and take advantage of the, the ITC and therefore would um, get get all of their, their energy directly from, from the PV system. Using this formula and certain other assumptions highlighted in the report, we found that residential PV plus storage LC, uh, uh, LCOS uh, is calculated to be $201 uh, per megawatt hour without the federal ITC and $124 per megawatt, hour, per megawatt hour with the 30% ITC. For commercial PV plus storage, uh, we found to be $113 per megawatt hour without the ITC and $73 per megawatt hour with the 30% ITC. For utility scale PV plus storage, we found it to be $83 per megawatt hour without the ITC and $57 per megawatt hour with the 30% ITC. So if you'd like to uh, learn more about our findings, please read the technical report or summary presentation and view the underlying data in our data file. Also, please feel free to contact us at our email addresses here. Uh, with that, I want to thank everyone for their attention and open it up to any questions. Yeah, um, David, I see that there are, uh, you know, a few questions in the um, Q&A section and, you know, I can read it out for you, you know, either you or I can uh, take the question, if that's okay. Oh, sorry, yeah, I was just uh, pulling, thanks for being nice. Uh, so, yeah, I'll, I can, I'll give it a try and then see how we do. Okay, so, sure. um, can you elaborate on why the current trend in the U.S. PV module market is moving towards monocrystalline modules compared to polycrystalline? What forces, as you understand it, are driving that trend? I'll take a first swing, but would definitely welcome my uh, co-authors. So, um, so uh, there is a large scale up in global um, manufacturing of uh, mono perk, which um, uh, greatly reduced the cost of um, manufacturing those uh, modules. Uh, and and um, but while still maintaining efficiency advantages, so. Um, on a global on a global scale, um, the the difference in price is not is not very great, but the difference in efficiency is great. And so, while mono panels are a little bit more expensive, um, you save money with racking. Uh, you can build a larger system. There's uh, less labor costs. So there's a there's a bunch of uh, benefits. Uh, so virtually, uh, there's just not a lot of multi being uh, sold in the US anymore. And, and that's really reflective of the overall global global trend. I don't know, Vignesh or Robert, feel free to any other things to note. Sure. Um, yeah, as David said, you know, um, while mono perk modules are, you know, uh, on the uh, uh, higher end of price, 
the higher efficiency kind of drives down uh, some of the balance of system components, right? Because you have higher efficiency for the given project uh, or system capacity, uh, you just need lower number of modules, which in turn drives down the uh, lower number of um, balance of system components. So, uh, yeah, thanks, David. Yeah, yeah, so this is this is Robert. So it certainly there's a, there's there are advan advantages of higher efficiency uh, on the system level. I mean, monoperc. So I mean, the production of monocrystalline silicon costs came down, uh, you know, pretty substantially in the past decade, and uh, and the processing equipment for for you know monoperc sort of advanced also. So again, it's sort of like because those costs were coming down. Um, you know, there there started to be a shift towards uh, mono perk as a as a dominant uh, uh, cell technology, and it pretty much can drop into the module production. Uh, so it was just sort of a pretty rapid shift uh, because of the efficiency advantages without having a cost penalty on on buying uh, finished finished cells. So thanks. Um, so the next question is, it's, it is stated on the drivers for the increased cost is increased module price. What are some of the reasons module prices increased recently? So um, I should just note that we're talking about uh, U.S. module prices, so which has slightly different market forces than, or very different market forces than global global um, averages for, for various reasons. Um, and uh, we're talking about for that, that was sort of last year. So, um, so as you all may be aware, there there are currently a host of um, um, tariffs in place on imported modules uh, and cells, uh, which uh, well, really just modules at this point. But um, so that's sort of causing um, uh, uh, less supply than than would be available or increased costs. Uh, and um, at that time, there was a run-up in um, in uh, demand for for uh, uh, these modules, um, and uh, this is sort of more of a supply demand. There wasn't really a great um, increase in price for 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 the modules between 2019 and 2020, um, but certainly the supply demand had an impact. Um, I think as as the year moved on and into this year, U.S. prices and, and global prices, uh, U.S. prices have come down a, a bit um, as the as the tariffs have have, have uh, been reduced um, and there's been there's been more supply available uh, and the costs have gone up. So <laughs> lots of reasons. Um, so the next question uh, is: If the presentation is being recorded, where can the record be found afterwards? Um, we'll send out a link. Um, so uh, for those who, who could not attend, uh, feel free to forward it on and, and we'll make that available. Um, next question. From your analysis, it seems as though module efficiency is still a main driver of TV system costs, but that is that is becoming less of a barrier. Is that analysis accurate? Um, so um, I'll take a first drive, but we definitely welcome others. Certainly. Uh, module efficiency um, is, a, is a large driver depending on um, system configuration and um, system, system limitations. So, for example, in our residential PV model, um, we assume a 22 panel system. So, uh, as you get a more efficient module, you can fit a larger system on uh, on, the, on that given in that given area, which allows for is sort of spread over more fixed costs over more watts. So on a dollars per watt basis, it gets cheaper. For 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 uh, commercial and utility scale systems, where we say pick a particular size, there are also obviously cost benefits of more efficiency um, by sort of um, you know lower labor 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 costs and lower racking on a per watt basis as you sort of fit more watts on in a given area. Um, so, but it's uh, so there are sort of two different efficiencies at play there, and it sort of depends on sort of how you're you're doing that. And certainly, as as we look over the past decade, there have been tremendous progress in the average 
uh, efficiency of modules and certainly even more so when you think about sort of average efficiencies installed as as the market has switched from from, from multi to mono recently in the past four or five years. Um, so the question is, is it becoming less of a barrier? I'm not sure I understand that, but um, Vignesh or Robert, any thoughts? Um, yeah, I, I don't see uh, the efficiency is becoming less of a barrier. I mean, that's the main cost driver in all of our uh, market sector. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'm not sure like what, what they mean by um, becoming less of a barrier, but you know, I'm happy to um, talk in details uh, if they could follow with us. Yeah, great idea. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, certainly there are diminishing returns to efficiency, um, you know, going, going from, you know, 15% to 20% efficient, you get more benefit than going from you know, 20% to 25% actually. So, so there are some diminishing returns as efficiency goes up. Um, <clears throat> that said, there are some really strong benefits as David alluded to in terms of being able to get more solar in the same space. So where your area constrained, um, <clears throat> it, it opens up uh, smaller spaces, particularly on the roof in the rooftop market. So, uh, because there are fixed costs and being able to spread those fixed costs over over a larger system uh, is really beneficial. So, you know, <clears throat> um, I, I know I had a, a system installed on my home this year, which is a, a like a four kilowatt, 12 panel system. Um, and five years ago, that probably would have been a three kilowatt system. And it's, it, it's been that, that you know, um, Biggest shift. So, and that that's more cost effective for for somebody to put on their roof that system because again, you only pay once for the the, the permitting, the interconnection. Uh, it required the same amount of racking, probably the same amount of labor. So there are, there are a lot of real uh, great benefits to efficiency that that will continue as efficiencies go higher. Thanks, Robert. That's great. Um, so next. Next question sort of forward looking. What techn technical or technological challenges do you think still need to be overcome to continue the trend of lower PV system costs across markets? We didn't really spend too much time in this report looking forward, but um, we have other analysis in this area. And obviously, the work we do sort of uh, can sort of help us think about sort of um, cost drivers. So um, I'll start, but I would definitely welcome Robert and Vignesh to chime in. Uh, Certainly from a residential side, you know, there's still significant soft costs that um, can be overcome. And we saw from, from our modeling that there's some, some examples of, uh, such as sort of incorporating PV into uh, new builds that would reduce soft costs tremendously. Obviously improvements in efficiency uh, will continue to uh, reduce costs and uh, other labor or BOS improvements with new, new technologies that should just make things faster or easier uh, and obviously there are a host of um, local and municipal um, um, procedures that uh, each system has to do that the more streamlined this could be the sort of cheaper it is but uh, Vignesh Robert any thoughts um, I, I, I would just add one more point on top of what David has mentioned so uh, there are some technological innovations on both, you know, uh, structural and electrical side that's happening in the market. For instance, um, uh, with our recent interviews, what we are learning is um, on the wire side, there's this um, uh, product, uh, you know, uh, called Big Lead Assembly, which is being installed predominantly in the market, which is said to have, you know, uh, reduced the uh, overall system cost uh, compared to you know a typical wiring used in a uh, installation. So, uh, but then again, you know we we are trying to capture the uh, uh, typical PV or energy storage projects, um, uh, kind of leaving out the uh, outliers. Uh, so um, there are definitely some advancements happening in the electrical and uh, structural balance of system. 
but you know um, it, it may be cost beneficial on a use case basis but we don't have enough data to prove you know they are cost effective on a large scale so once we have the data we'll kind of incorporate them in our model to report what kind of advancements are contributing to the um, uh, decrement in the total system cost Yeah, I do. I do think it's important to also mention, and, and you kind of alluded to it, Rignesh. You know, the the integration of PV and storage is becoming more and more critical for cost effectiveness. So, to some degree, it's not just lower PV system cost, but also improved PV system integration with storage, or with how uh, you know if you're on a on a building, how energy is used within that building. Um, whether there's some storage or demand responsiveness within the building. Um, again, as we see more electric vehicles coming into the marketplace, um, integration with uh, when EVs are charged, so can they be optimal charged for when low cost PV is available? So there's a much broader set of issues around systems, uh, PV system integration with the broader uh, energy use and systems that are, that are, that are out there. So the, the, the cost per se of the, of the PV technology, particularly the, the modules, it's, it's not becoming the big barrier. It's about, can you manage the, the variability well? That's great, yeah. So similar, uh, related question, but, uh, which is, you know, we, we model batteries, but uh, the question is, we analyze other storage methods, uh, such as pumps, Pump storage. Um, and to that I would just say that General um, at large has done that, and there's a lot of efforts underway. Uh, most notably, the uh, energy storage grand challenge, uh, which uh, um, DOE is is organizing. But um, uh, but for this this report, we didn't, uh, and I think that's mostly you know the majority of new systems. Um, being built and paired with PV is is batteries. So, sort of we're we're reflecting sort of national trends. Uh, certainly, if you uh, if you look at the historically the the the, uh, the I think still the, the, by far the greatest amount of storage on the on the greatest pumped of hydro. But, but as far as new systems, uh, it's, it's because of the tremendous decrease in battery prices, it's, um, it's batteries so that's what we're, we're focusing on but I, I believe there is a there was a past few years there's a great NREL report on sort of how the synergies of of, of siting PV with uh, near near uh, hydro facilities so um, um, so the next question um, I understand that installation cost reductions in 2020 was mainly due to decreased uh, decrease of BUS costs what in BUS contributed the decrease of BUS costs um, can you speak to that or? Yeah, sure. Um, so basically the driver again here is the uh, increased efficiency, which kind, which kind of reduced uh, some of the balance of system components, like, you know, uh, the number of uh, vertical columns required or the uh, number of combiner boxes required. So um, this is what has been driving the, you know, um, the decrease of balance of system cost. And, um, you know, um, we have a detailed model and um, it might be a long list of components I can give you. So, um, uh, but, you know, feel free to reach out to me via email and I can um, go over the model and show you what are the different uh, cost components, um, you know, have been impacted by this in improved efficiency. And, uh, you know, that has resulted in decreasing the number of balance of system components over the years. Thanks very much, that's great. So there's a question on financing and sort of uh, on what sorts of financing programs make solar most acceptable on the commercial and utility side of things. Um, this is a great question. We don't spend a ton of time uh, in this report um, on financing, although the, sort of they, they are uh, inputs to our LCOE and LCOSS models. Um, but so we rely on other other analysis for that. Um, so generally, we use sort of sort of again national, mostly national average, but sort of um, sort of leading uh, sources of financing 
due to the the various tax credits uh, and tax incentives to solar typically involves third party financing and um, but not always so um, I, I spent a lot of time on financing so any questions on that I'd be happy to follow up with you afterwards on that uh, so slide 13 showed a large drop in cost between 2010 and 2012 commercial installation sizes growing uh, approaching one gigawatt is there potential for another step down in costs? Um, I can't really remember the the one gigawatt, but I would I will say that there was, certainly was a large decrease in costs around that time, and that was um, in, in large part due to a scale up in global manufacturing that caused a tremendous reduction in in, in module uh, costs. I think there were also other costs that the U.S. really you know took off if you sort of look at uh, the, the growth uh, of, of U.S. installations is just uh, is, um, kept is bigger and bigger. So, so uh, is, uh, installers have a better understanding of what approaches to do and things like that. But a lot of it was hardware. Um, I feel like we're always saying the last five years uh, there's more. There's been more than half of the installation or more than half of all PV systems were installed in the last five years. We're, we're always saying that because it's just always the industry is just getting bigger and bigger. So I think that was one of those periods of, of growth. And certainly, uh, there's another great 2012 and 2013 was another period of a lot of um, um, uh, bankruptcies for global manufacturing because um, perhaps scaled too big and uh, and and their and their profit margins went down too far. But um, so now the next question, uh, your efficiency and prices for installed PV systems seem very low. Are you using Chinese chip stuff or high efficiency, uh, better built, uh, sorry, lost the, uh, uh, better built American systems like SunPower or Tesla? Um, well, so, uh, I'll just say that, um, our efficiencies are and prices are based off of national averages. So we have um, LBNL uh, uh, has done a great great job of collecting uh, actually installed systems with uh, real data on what type of module was installed and how efficient that module is. Um, and um, California also uh, has a great uh, transparent database that sort of provides a lot of that. Uh, data for, for for more recent uh, current year stuff, and so the numbers we use are are based off of that. SunPower certainly has more efficient panels, but they also are um, um, more more expensive typically because uh, of their uh, And I would just say that the the again the, also the prices those were I would just, I, I should note those reflect um, sort of factory gate. Uh, pricing. Uh, so there are other prices that you know people might get, uh, and you can see this in the report, particularly for residential systems. That sort of um, when you see the price, it's not directly comparable because if you say bought it uh, the module uh, um, from uh, a, um, a wholesaler, uh, there might be markup. Uh, the shipping costs uh, money. Um, uh, there are warehousing. There's all sorts of uh, things that would sort of increase the price. Um, so these are these are more sort of the prices, and and we incorporate those costs into other into the um, supply chain costs that we represent in the model. Uh, next question: Why has module manufacturing predominantly in the in the far east? Is there opportunity with automation to bring it back to the test? <laughs> That's a great question, uh, and we we the three of us. Do spend a lot of time on that, uh, but not part of this analysis. So definitely would welcome discussion on that, uh, but but perhaps um, um, offline. Uh, but it's a great question. Um, uh, is is CPV dead? Is there opportunity for revival? Uh, we didn't we didn't model that here, uh, and no. Uh, yes. I'll, I'll, we we didn't. Uh, I'll just briefly say that I'm happy to have a larger discussion. And, Robert and Vignesh, feel free to, to tune in, but uh, to chime in. But uh, module 
the module, the module manufacturer, the PV manufacturing industry has scaled up so greatly and prices of uh, panels have gotten so cheap, it's very hard for some of these smaller um, technologies um, um, that sort of haven't achieved such manufacturing scale to sort of compete at such low prices and to, to, to get to that, those costs, to scale up to get to those costs. But there's other reasons as well, but I would sort of, um, yeah, say that. Uh, can we have copies of the charts? Uh, yeah, feel free to reach out to us. We, we do make the data available, um, and we do have the uh, PowerPoint slides that, that have the charts, but if you, um, yeah, just feel free to email us if you'd like additional um, uh, material. Uh, another question, with respect to LCUSF, does your model factor in savings by operators who allow stored power to flow back into the grid while not using well, not use something. Um, so I think there's a big difference between um, sort of the value, if, I, if I'm, if I'm uh, reading this correctly, there's a big difference between the value of solar plus storage uh, and, and the cost. So we're just really taking into account uh, the costs, the cost to build it, the cost to maintain it, um, how much electricity is going to be fed to the grid. There's this whole question of other value um, and the value that it brings that sort of is not detailed in this analysis that requires a lot more sophisticated modeling. Um, and so I would sort of think that um, think that sort of thing would fall more into the value, uh, if I understand it correctly. But Robert and Vignesh, feel free to chime in if I um, I'm misinterpreting it. Uh, the next question is on uh, Australia PV costs are very low, I believe 70 cents per watt. Is there a certain boundary that they overcame that US is not possibly soft costs or is this due to subsidies? Great question. We have, um, we have another um, series of reports we do. Um, every quarter we release um, uh, industry update, solar industry update. Which, um, happy to share with you or feel free to just Google uh, it. And the, the most recent one, we sort of explain the differences in soft costs between uh, Australia and Germany, which is relatively low cost of residential PV and the US. Uh, and there's a there's a host of reasons, um, which you know include, you know, they don't have as many tariffs on their uh, hardware, uh, their permitting uh, and uh, interconnection and inspections. Um, PII um, uh, procedures are um, a lot more streamlined. Um, um, there, some of their uh, safety requirements are, are different. Um, they have different financing. There's a host of issues that that um, sort of differentiate the marketplaces. And there are a lot of solutions potentially that that the U.S. Uh, can implement to to get lower, uh, but there are also some sort of inherent issues and um, differences. So I would be happy to, to discuss that later or feel, again, uh, the first note I would, I would check out the most recent uh, industry update that we put before. Um, the uh, next question, uh, what are the opportunities to integrate modules with the home roof shingles? Similarly to what Tesla is doing, will make it aesthetically pleasing. I understand we would mitigate thin film for that to happen. Uh, thoughts? Um, I could come up with an answer, but I think Robert or Vignesh would probably come up with a better answer on, on those. Uh, I mean, there's a like there's a lot that's happening in that space. Uh, some of it with crystalline uh, silicon technology and some of it with uh, potentially emerging thin films like perovskites or, or others. Uh, so uh, there are huge opportunities there. Um, it's part of the, the um, potential for cost reductions, which are even broader by integrating into both the new home market and the roofing market more broadly. So again, there are a lot, and again, we do talk about the new home market in, in this benchmark report, and we've done uh, a couple of years ago, we published our, a roadmap for residential PV cost reductions uh, that looked at new homes and integration with uh, roofing uh, practices more generally. So, 
Uh, thanks, Robert. Um, so the last question, um, oh, there's actually, sorry, there's two more questions. Uh, so one of the, the penultimate question as of, as of now is, uh, or more of a comment, which is to say that we, a lot of, uh, it's, it's, a, it's tough for the, um, for installers who sort of, um, who see some of the low prices of say modules, module prices, uh, and when they have to sort of sell systems, sort of the prices they're getting are much higher. And I think that's a, a great, a great comment and it is, it is an issue. And we try to be uh, in the report as transparent of sort of some of these additional costs that um, can be borne by um, um, systems. Um, so, you know, just as the module for a residential system, you know, uh, a lot of wholesalers have to, you know, um, buy and hold modules. And so the, the module that you might be getting on your system might be six months old because um, uh, of matching issues or other things. And so the price six months might, might be, ago might be higher than it is now uh, or in just the cost to carry it. And, and there are other costs. So um, there are also costs that sort of maybe not be either typical or that are um, due to uh, local regulations that um, um, specifically. So it, it can be tough and, and we, we try in the report to do as best of a job as we can of sort of talking about some of these other costs and sort of talking and explaining sort of what, what, what we're talking about when we talk about these costs and where we're getting the information. So. Uh, another question about Texas or a, a question about Texas. Uh, we were trying to find out if it's best to use batteries versus gas generators, generators versus emergencies. That metering didn't work. Some panels were covered with snow. Um, yeah, it's a good, good, uh, good question. I, we, we do a lot of work at NREL. I'd be happy to, if you want to reach out, we can probably get you folks who, who look at the issues. I will say that depending on how a PV system is, is installed uh, can be more or less ready to handle sort of these these issues um, and and certainly right yeah with snow it's hard you can't hard to produce power but there's certainly um, ways of making it uh, designing a system so that it's sort of less susceptible to that sort of issue by snow snow coming off um, but yeah good question and, and we there there are definitely folks at NREL working on some of those things and sort of thinking about the trade off. Um, so that's all I have, and we're a minute early. So unless there are any other questions, um, thanks all for for those who who were um, who, who attended, and we really appreciate the questions and, and your time. And and uh, and if any more questions come up, or um, or if you just want, uh, yeah, other anything else, just feel free to reach out to us. Uh, uh, just uh, yeah, we're trying to be uh, of use. So. Um, Oh, yeah, so if we can be useful, let us know. Thanks, thanks a lot. And I just want to also thank uh, Big Nash and Robert uh, for, for doing this with me. Thanks, David. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.